Today I'm in conversation with Professor Patrick Corrigan. He's a distinguished professor of psychology at the Illinois Institute of Technology. His research interests are in stigma and discrimination experienced by people with health conditions and disabilities, also psychiatric difficulties and rehabilitation. He's currently a principal investigator at the National Consortium for Stigma and Empowerment. He has written more than 400 peer-reviewed articles, is editor emeritus of the American Journal of Psychiatric Rehabilitation. He's editor of a new journal published by the American Psychological Association called Stigma and Health. Patrick has authored or edited 15 books, including Coming Out Proud to Erase the Stigma of Mental Illness. He is also part of the team that developed the Honest Open Proud series of anti-stigma programs. Patrick, it's wonderful to have you with us today as part of the series that we're doing to speak out and destigmatize lived experience in the mental health professions. Perhaps you could talk to us a little bit about your experience of what it's been like to be a mental health professional with lived experience. So I, I think uh, my training um, really urged us to keep those two things separate um, and sort of forgot I was one whole human being. And so um, I've been a psychologist for 30 years and I think our training back then was not to remember that as a helper, I'm also a person who needs help. So I've struggled with serious mental illness um, for probably about 40 years. It started in college. Um, I've um, been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, major depression, generalized anxiety disorder, um, have been hospitalized on a locked unit because of it. Um, know the shame. Um, in American units, they usually have one phone on the unit and a wall, and so everybody's got to line up to call. And the shame to call my wife to tell her to tell my daughter Liz I wouldn't be at school that night um, for her presentation. Um, it um, has been pretty disabling. Um, I got through undergrad okay. But then because of my recurring symptoms, started and quit a lot of programs. Um, I was in medical school, was pursuing psychiatrist, became overwhelmed and quit. Um, actually was seeking a clinical psychology doctoral program, became overwhelmed and quit, got a master's degree, was in a PhD program in the philosophy of science, became overwhelmed and quit. Um, got a, in the United States, it's called a PsyD, which is a professional clinical psychology degree. Um, went on a postdoc at UCLA, became overwhelmed and quit. Um, finally moved back to Chicago, um, Illinois Institute of Technologies in Chicago, where I grew up. Um, got a job at a medical school at U of C, University of Chicago. Um, became wigged out. <laughs> and almost quit. Um, I think um, I benefited from psychiatry. I, I take meds this morning, but support and family have clearly been the two things that have made a difference for me. I can really resonate with that actually, for sure. Um, I've been lucky enough to have a family who've been really supportive when I broke down. And uh, yeah, I was on antidepressants for just over a year myself. Um, and then, then I came off, but I've, I've always had um, therapy alongside my work, which has been Yeah, really so I have a sort of a blue collar family. So they never understood any of this. Um, they never understood yeah. why I would go in psychiatry. It takes work sometimes. <laughs> Um, they don't understand what clinical psychology is. They don't understand, you know, they sort of think I sit and have somebody on a couch and hypnotize them. Um, and so my own mental health struggles are very, very foreign to them. Um, but they are of a generation. They're what it is, regardless, we stand by you. Um, my wife, who's an attorney, um, is not really a mentally health trained person, but she has been there through a lot of turmoil. And I think those two rocks really made a difference in my life. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it for sure. It sounds like it. And when you're talking about the, the, the support around you, I'm thinking about the importance of our peers as well. 
And did you find peers or other allies within the profession who who were alongside you too? Or how was that for you? Well, peers as you use it um, is really a, really a new idea. Um, I mean, I can tell you I've been in practice long enough that if people started talking about peers being the source of uh, help, support, mental health, um, people will respond that, you know, you're letting the, the psychos run the nut house. Um, nobody would ever would have thought that was a good idea. Um, and so people were in the closet about it. People didn't talk mm -hmm. about it, um, which partly – you know, as your listeners realize, partly is such a, a foreign idea since one out of five of us struggling with some sort of a thing like this. An even stranger idea in the mental health profession with the idea of wounded healers is because of people's own mental health challenges, they tend to go into this sort of stuff, so it's even more. Um, but we're really not encouraged to talk about it. Um, other than going to therapy so that you can get a right mind so you can be able to help other people because you're cured. Um, yeah. After struggling about this for a long time, um, there were two colleagues of mine, very special colleagues, Stan and John, um, who I worked with when I was at University of Chicago. And when I'm when symptoms come back, I feel like I'm going to explode. And so I just need someone to know. I don't need them to sit down and do therapy with me. I mean, I do have therapists on and off, but I just don't want to be alone with it. And first I let Stan know. Um, and then I let John know. John and I work at Illinois Tech together. Um, John has his own travails. Um, in fact, in the Coming Out Proud book, John is the second chapter in the book. And so it's just not being alone with it. It's just having somebody know is a big thing for me. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and certainly something about uh, setting up that peer support of other mental health professionals with lived experience, even finding them and, 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 and creating a place where people could network together and talk about that was as good for me as it was as good for anybody else. Just this sense of belonging, not being alone and not feeling like the only one. Because it was also the idea of the helper principle is that um, when you're mentally ill, you're not just a, a victim, a patient. Um, you have worth of a peer to be there, um, support, maybe some good ideas to other people with mental health challenges. And that builds up my own sense of self-esteem and self-efficacy. I'm not just a broken victim. I have something to offer. That's, that's absolutely right. And that, that's a place where sometimes can feel really difficult to, to, to work your way into is that you have something to offer. Because so often having lived experience of mental health difficulties is synonymous with worthlessness or um, something to be really ashamed of. And when you're in that place, whoever you are, you know, whatever your role is, it, you know, mental health professional or not, and, and, and perhaps even being a mental health professional puts something on top of that because there's a sense of slight idealization or something that you have to be always perfect, you know? You're right. I think one of the best things that happened in mental health in the last 10 to 15 years here is peer support. And so while 20 years ago, listeners might have had a hard time finding other people in the same situation. Um, 20 years ago, brave men and women with mental illness started coming out and telling their stories, and there's more and more of us. And you doing um, video interviews like this adds to it. And so we know the cadre of people in recovery is getting larger and larger all the time. And so people don't feel alone. And if they want to find a group, there are some online um, with COVID-19, things are becoming more and more virtual. Um, there are things face to face someday, hopefully we'll get out of all this and um, people yeah. can choose what works for them. For sure. What do you think of what systems have to do in order to become more compassionate or open to this? 
I'm thinking about what I call the different pillars of the mental health scene, you know, the training institutions, the workplaces, the NHS trusts over here, um, the, the professional bodies. Is it, they have to take responsibility for kind of opening up these, con- these conversations and being providing a place where they're willing to kind of receive and talk and talk about it. Because somebody, if somebody may be wanting to open up about something, but they're really worried about negative judgment. They're really worried about what's going to come back. You know, what, what does the system, you know, have to do? I always like to begin from a position of recognizing and honoring people for going into this field. Uh, I mean, they genuinely have compassion and want to help people with such personal misery. Um, and they need to recognize how it has been very limited in its approach, um, especially when we put up this artificial barrier between we, the doctor, and you, the patient. Um, and that could be as big a problem as the illness itself. I think there have been some major changes in my career. Um, I think recovery, which although it's currently supported by research, the agenda was pushed by people with lived experience. And so the idea of recovery um, is when I first learned about schizophrenia, I learned it as a kiss of death diagnosis. If you got it, you were through. And my job was to help you get used to living on the back ward of a hospital. And we know partly recovery is an outcome. Um, We do know research tells us that people with mental illnesses as serious as um, schizophrenia can become totally symptom free, sometimes even without medication. Um, But we know more importantly that recovery is a process that um, despite this diagnostic tag we put on you, um, you should be hopeful that actually one of the worst things doctors ever do it is they stole hope from people, um, that you should aspire to your goals, and that my job as a healthcare professional is to do whatever it takes, conceivably takes, to help you achieve those goals. So if you want to go to medical school and you have schizophrenia, um, my job is to help you figure out what you need to do to get to medical school. I mean, you do need to realize it's a big bar for everybody, but if you want to go after it um, in the United States, that means go take a bachelor's degree in science and then take this God awful entrance exam. And then if you want to do that, spend four years in medical school and then spend five years in residency. But if you want to do that, um, we have something called reasonable accommodations. We should make sure the system's set up so you can do it, just like we would expect the system to be set up for somebody in a wheelchair so they can make it through med school. Absolutely. I'm thinking about stories that I've heard. People have different experiences, for example, of um, becoming unwell, which word I use, unwell with mental health and and they need time out, you know, and their experiences of re-entering the workplace or re-entering training have been incredibly difficult. And there's been all sorts of things about if somebody had been ill with their physical health, they might receive cards or flowers, but this sense of nobody saying anything and not knowing what to do uh, and, and, and not knowing what to say when people come back in and also not seeming to have, some places don't seem to have a recovery ethic on the inside of, of, of this for mental health professionals. You know, they're not, they're not seeming to help. Yes, there's reasonable adjustments, but the ethic isn't seem to help people reapproach those things that they would like to engage again with in a way that, in a way that they can, that there's time and effort put into people being able to reclaim um, from the trauma, you know, reclaim uh, their work lives. Uh, sometimes it feels really hard to know whether you know, the extent to which that exists on the inside sometimes. Mental illness is still stained by shame. Um, Even though we think as a generation, we know more about mental illness than ever before. Um, So it still leads people to not wanting to reach out and talk to someone with mental health challenges. It still leads us to not knowing what to do when a colleague comes back to work. Um, I do think 
it's important for your listeners to remember that one of the most stigmatizing professions of all, I talking to lawyers, plumbers, electricians, one of the most stigmatizing profession is psychiatrists. And the second most stigmatizing profession is psych clinical psychologists. And that's because at least for serious mental illness, we tend to see people when they're really sick. And so we tend to characterize mm -hmm. and reduce them to really crazy behaviors. And we forget first that people can do a lot um, despite crazy behaviors. And second, sometimes those crazy behaviors go away altogether. But the analogy I keep coming back to is nobody would presume to sell somebody in a wheelchair, they could not pursue their goals. And we all would demand that the system be set up so they could do it. I agree with you, the hard task, I mean, I have to even admit personally, if somebody, God forbid, got in a car accident and was away for six months and came back in a wheelchair, I would struggle for how to say it. You know, I'd probably ask, you know, Natalie, how do you want to talk mm -hmm. about this? Um, yeah. I think one of the things that's really opening up the mental health system is the degree to which the mental health system's hiring peers. Um, I yeah. think having a peer on a clinical team right next to me does two things. One is if I am an ignorant, ignorant bigot, I'm probably not going to make mental health jokes when the person's in the room. And the other is it just changes the whole dialogue. It's like you're a peer. You're, you're, you're not just a peer for the quote unquote patient. You're a peer for me, a provider. Mm -hmm. And so it just changes the whole arithmetic into being broken. No, just it's a stage of life. You're now recuperating and we're all sharing coming from, we all are sharing coming from experience, a lived experience. I think I saw something that you said, the two things knit together, actually some experiences that I've seen of people working as an intentional peer support workers, their lived experience. They, they go into, they're recruited and want this job because of their lived experience. And then they start training into the registered mental health professionals and something really odd happens. It's, it's, as if, it's as if suddenly where that lived experience was just accepted as a part of themselves was of real value in, in their work and their job. And this isn't, this isn't in every situation, but it's some that I've heard and I think it's interesting. We come into registered mental health professionals and some, somehow the narrative turns over to talk of risk monitoring Occupational health seemed to start to take a slightly different stance to it. And it's just very interesting why that happens. So it's a tough issue. I mean, let's be absolutely clear, anybody listening to this, if you're struggling with mental health issues, if you have schizophrenia and you're thinking about going and getting a job as a clinical psychologist, they see nothing in that experience that should stop you from doing it. Um, the challenge partly is the old school, my generation people, who still are holding on to this idea that people with really serious mental illness are incapable of doing this. Um, and partly we're going to die out, and partly peers are going to squash that idea, so that's good. Um, <laughs> The other challenge, though, is a legitimate challenge we all have of how much we use lived experience in helping others because um, you have to ask yourself, especially when you're in a therapeutic relationship, the degree and the extent to which you want to disclose. Um, not so much because you'll be vulnerable, though that shouldn't be neglected, but you also have to remember the idea of therapy. Therapy is it is more or less a one-way helping relationship. Um, the pe person is coming to me to help them, um, which can be a bit different than the kind of mutuality to peer services. That doesn't mean I don't talk about my lived experience. It just means I need to make sure anytime I do, it's there to help them and not to help me. Um, but again, that coming to from, come up, yeah. you know, coming in background, I know you've talked about being psychodynamic and psychoanalytic. Um, the, the tradition is for the therapist to be opaque, for the therapist not to disclose anything about her or himself. Therefore, anything the patient thinks they are projecting onto the therapist and is representing their own issues. So again, I grew up with keeping it a secret. 
Um, I do think younger generation professionals are getting beyond that. Again, you still need to tackle um, the degree to which you're going to disclose in a formal helping relationship. Um, it comes up with a question there for listener, if you're a young person, should you bring up your serious mental illness when you're interviewing for graduate school? Um, I have mixed thoughts about that. On one hand, as an authentic person, I would say, damn right, this is who I am, take it or leave it. On the other hand, you still need to realize there are people out there, doctors out there, who will hold that against you, who will discriminate against you because of that. And so you, it's like everything in disclosure, I say it's a balance and you need to decide for yourself what you want to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've, I've got a few things in my mind. One, one thing is about the, the sharing within the therapeutic relationship. And the other thing is about um, the, the younger people like coming up now uh, through the time to change seen through lots of changes within schools about how people talk about mental health and mental well-being, you know, and, 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 and the therapeutic relationship, one of my thoughts were that there is some, you know, research starting about that. And there needs to be more. Um, Dr. Johnny Lovell from York has done a really interesting study with both service users and professionals to, to ask exactly those questions. What is helpful about sharing and to what extent and about what kinds of things, not just about mental health. And I think, I think it's really interesting to see that research go forward and to really understand what's useful. So you don't get this kind of role reversal, which is one of the terms that he used. Um, and the other thing is about the young people kind of coming up through about whether they, you know, and, and also over here kind of clinical psychology courses, really opening up about lived experience at interview levels and, and things like that. Although it still is, still does feel like a tightrope to walk. Um, but they'll be, they'll be coming in perhaps from a very different culture now of being used to being it's able to talk about. Definitely things. getting better. Um, yeah. We, we, you talked about the honest, open, proud program and we talk, we've been working on that for about 12 years now. And in the last seven or so we've moved from adults which is who I traditionally work with to college students and high school kids. And in some ways it is so delightful because their attitude about coming out with a mental illness is somewhat like attitudes of 10, 15 years ago of coming out gay. It's like, that's your problem, not mine. I'm gay and here I am, take it or leave it. People, younger people with mental illness more and more are saying, you know, here I am, all or nothing. So there is some hope that the stigma is going down. I caution that, though, because in the Western world, while they've made great steps in LGBTQ rights, we still should not be naive as to think it's gone away. Um, that doesn't mean an individual should not disclose. That means an individual should be fully informed and decide for her or himself what to disclose, when, where, for what reason. And that's pretty much what the Honest, Open, Proud program is about, is you decide whether you want to disclose um, who you might disclose to. So, Natalie, you seem to be a nice person. We, could, If you were in the United States, we could go to Starbucks and have a cup of coffee, and I could say, hey, did you see Silver Linings Playbook? What did you think? And you say, oh, we were seeing that movie, and I say it's with Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence, and Bradley Cooper has bipolar disorder, and he has some troubles. And if you say, I'm sick and tired of those Hollywood movies making these crazy people look good, then you're probably not a good person for me to come out to. So I can test I you be, out. No, in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> I can test you out ahead of time. Yeah. And then the third element of yeah. hop is it's your story. Um, what's it going to say? And by the way, my story has been evolving for 40 years and it's continued to evolve and it evolves depending on who I talk to. Um, interestingly enough, I started my career in a psychiatry department in a medical school. Um, I'm now working at a graduate school of psychology. Um, I do, I probably do lectures well before the shutdown. I do lectures two or three times uh, a month. And I'm very reticent to talk about mental health background in psychiatry departments. 
not so much because I don't want them to know, but because recovery and peers is still a bit of a radical idea to them. And I don't want them to dismiss my research because they'll say, well, you're just a crazy guy. You don't know. Um, so I am aware the degree to which I tell my story. I can tell you the place I'm most at home at our peer groups or conferences led by people with lived experience. I mean, you know, that's like my folks um, for sure. <laughs> I was in one of those, a couple of those just recently, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really heartwarming. <laughs> right, well, listen, thank you so much for joining us with this. And is there any, 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 any final thing that you'd like to say that I, that I haven't mentioned or that you, you wanted to leave us with? Stigma is evolving. Um, the secret to changing it is not a bunch of experts coming out and showing MRIs and saying this is a brain disorder. The secret is the people you're interviewing coming out and telling their story of recovery, that there is an on the way down aspect to it. There are symptoms and challenges and they do come back, but there is an on the way up aspect to it there's a reason to be hopeful and there's a reason to demand change and your group what you're doing is a great step in that direction thanks thank you very much